In this episode, we talk about stopping asteroids from hitting the Earth and the recent comments made by the ISRO chairman S. Somnath. We also talk about the results of the recently concluded bipolar elections and what they mean for the opposition. But first, we talk about a Muslim woman's right to claim maintenance. Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. Last week on Wednesday, the Supreme Court dismissed a special leave petition, which is essentially supposed to be an appeal against a high court judgment. This plea had been filed by a Muslim man from Telangana, who had been ordered by the high court to pay about 20,000 rupees per month as maintenance to his ex-wife. When we spoke to Indian Express's Apurva Vishwanath, she told us why this man had approached the Supreme Court regarding this order. So the man's claim was that since his former wife had already claimed maintenance under Muslim personal law, she was not entitled to claim maintenance under the Code of Criminal Procedure. Section 125 of the CRPC requires a man to pay maintenance if the wife is unable to maintain herself. If he doesn't do so, there are penal consequences, including a jail term. And unlike personal laws, this of course applies to people of all religions. So, in the appeal, the man's contention, if you look at it as a question of law, was that when there is a special legislation, in this case, it is the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act. This is a 1986 legislation. So, when there is a special legislation, that should override general law. You know, that's how we understand in interpretation. For example, the POXO Act, right, the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences, that act, which is a special penal legislation, overrides your customary law, which allows, say, perhaps child marriage. So wherever there is a special legislation, the common understanding is that that overrides general law. And this was essentially the man's claim, that because there is a special legislation under which his former wife had already claimed maintenance, she should not be able to claim the extra 20,000 rupees per month under the CRPC, which the Telangana High Court had asked him to pay. But the court rejected this argument like it has done for the last 20 years. And Apurva, can you talk a bit about the legal precedent that the Supreme Court followed while dismissing this appeal? So, I mean, you know, this reading of the court is not for the first time. Right from the Shabano ruling in 1985, after that, In 2001, there is the Daniel Latifi ruling. So the Supreme Court has always maintained that Section 125 CRPC, the framing of the provision, which contains a may and not a shall, right? So which means the woman may choose to go here or there or both. So the framing of the CRPC law is such that the woman is not cast aside if she has already claimed her maintenance in personal law. Another distinction is that the personal law, which is the Muslim women's rights law only obligates a Muslim man to pay maintenance for the Iddat period, you know, and it's not after that, you know, or say, suppose, till she remarries or some such thing. It's only for the Iddat period, which in Muslim law is essentially three lunar cycles or three lunar months. Whereas the CRPC provision, which applies to everybody, says that the maintenance will be paid if the wife cannot maintain herself, which could extend to a longer period, right? So, and it doesn't depend on any other criteria, whether there was meher paid, whether there was dowry exchange, none of those factors come into play. So, the court's consistent stand has been that irrespective of what the religious customary law says, the CRPC provision would still prevail. And Apurva, was Shah Bano the case that started all of this? In fact, even before Shah Bano, we've had rulings to this effect. Shah Bano, of course, cemented it. And, you know, there was this whole issue that was fraught politically and also from within the Muslim community after Shah Bano, which prompted the government to enact this legislation that we are talking about, the 1986 Muslim Women's Rights Act. What it did was essentially codify the customary law. But even that was challenged. And in the Daniel Latifi ruling, the court says, even if you codify customary law, it'll still come to the same effect that, you know, you cannot bypass Section 125 of the CRPC. In Wednesday's ruling, the court takes the same line and says CRPC will still continue as an option. One of the judges, Justice Nagaratna, in fact says, and I'm quoting her here, that this court would not countenance unjust or Faustian bargains being imposed on women. 
the emphasis on sufficient maintenance not a minimal amount so which means that it is to maintain the woman and it's not just during the iddat period as a minimum amount that is paid to her but it should be sufficient to you know sustain her otherwise which is where the crpc provision really comes in okay so just to recap according to the muslim personal law the man only has to pay maintenance to the woman during the iddat period but the crpc says that the man will have to pay maintenance to her if she is unable to maintain herself and that can of course last for much longer than the iddat period the 4 months and again the woman can essentially choose any recourse she wants either the one offered by the muslim personal law or the crpc now talk about the reason why this issue has been so contentious the contention really is how we frame personal laws in india right i mean whether it is the hindu religion or the muslim religion or any other religion in india personal laws have existed much before the constitution so the idea that they are patriarchal limiting for women is not new i mean whereas the constitution secures us the right to equality gender parity is one of the key principles in our constitution of course what we have done in india is codify religious law what we call as personal law whether it comes to hindu law or muslim law these are all codified legislations so there is a friction between the guiding principles of the constitution and personal law of course as we move forward as a society a lot of these issues come to light and you know they are litigated in courts but it is this ruling is especially important even though it is just reiterating what the court has decided two decades ago because it doesn't frame the question as constitution versus personal laws but says that the personal laws have to complement the principles of the constitution so it's not an either or or a adversarial litigation but your personal law exists but the constitution's principles do not go away and apurva here we are talking about the crpc prevailing over a muslim personal law but could you also cite an example where we see this happening to a hindu personal law of course all religions have their own practices right even in hindu law succession was a very fraught issue till the hindu code sort of kicked in and it was almost in the 80s where women were entitled the right to succession and it's only much later that you really saw this being implemented uh, the abolition of bigamy for example these were not all issues that were already there in hindu law it came over time through reform in fact some of them through court rulings the issue of succession has actually been piloted through court rulings and now for example in the parsi community the issue of excommunication is pending before the court temple entry is another issue that's pending before the court so there are a lot of areas where personal law has caused friction and how it's being applied vis-a-vis the constitution but lots of these aspects are something that are still being litigated in courts and next we talk about planetary defense the efforts made by scientists to track asteroids and comets which could potentially cause significant damage to the earth last week while interacting with reporters the isro chairman s somnath said something that caught everyone's attention so the isro chairman somnath he was at an event in bangalore last week that's indian express's amitabh sinha and there in his remarks to the reporters he mentioned this asteroid event that is happening in 2029 and he said you know there are missions that are they are going to study the asteroid and we should be part of it the asteroid he was talking about is called apophis which is supposed to come quite close to the earth in 2029 it was discovered in 2004 and the initial calculations were that it had some possibility of coming and hitting the earth right initially some scientists had said that there was a 2.7% chance that it could crash into earth which was considerably higher than anything we had seen before yes yes that's right so anything that is non zero is taken as you know something of a risk to the earth so this certainly had a non zero possibility that was evaluated at that point of time subsequent assessments have shown that there is zero possibility of it hitting either in 2029 or in 2036 or in 2068 so at least for the next 100 years that's what nasa says there is no possibility of this asteroid coming and hitting the earth right and this is the asteroid that somnath was talking about but tell us if this asteroid is no longer a threat what is the reason that he was talking about it 
So now what has happened is even though it's not going to hit the earth, it's going to come quite close to earth. In fact, it's going to come for a very small time. It would be passing through at a distance of about 32,000 kilometers from the earth. And that is closer to some of our satellites that are placed in the geostationary orbit. So that means it would come quite close to the earth. So what some of the agencies are doing, they are sending probe missions. They are sending spacecraft to study this asteroid. And uh, till now, ISRO had not revealed any such plans. You know, they have talked about different kinds of moon missions going up till 2040. But the asteroid mission had not been publicly discussed. So when Somanath talked about it, no, it was the first, this expression of intention of sending a spacecraft to study this asteroid. This would be the first of its kind for ISRO. Also, he is not very clear as of now. And I mean, we'll come to know only subsequently. As of now, it's not clear whether ISRO would want to send its own spacecraft or would collaborate with other space agencies and become part of the studies that are planned for this asteroid. Right. And this is what got people talking about planetary defense. Because at any given point, there are millions and millions of asteroids and comets flying around in space. And the idea of planetary defense is to track these and keep them away from Earth. But tell us how big of a risk are asteroids? What are the chances that a big one could actually hit the Earth? Right. So small asteroids keep coming to the Earth almost every day. Most of them are leftovers from uh, very old days when the solar system was still being formed. Planets were getting formed. And these are leftovers from these planets, which are like, you know, moving around the sun. So most of them get burnt when they get into the Earth's atmosphere. So as we know, the Earth has an atmosphere. And once they enter the Earth's atmosphere, because of the friction, they get burned. And most of them are not able to reach the Earth's surface. But fairly big ones have hit the Earth in the past. They have caused widespread damage. And as you know, a lot of people, a lot of us know, the extinction of dinosaur is attributed to one such collision. Dinosaurs were not the only ones which got eliminated from the Earth's surface. Most of the species that existed during that time that got erased from the Earth because of this collision from an asteroid that happened about 6.5 million years ago, that was a fairly large one. After that, we haven't had that kind of a collision, but we have had several others which have the potential to cause damage. You know, they leave craters. I mean, in the last 100 years, I think there have been two instances where there have been uh, some noticeable damage that has been caused by uh, these asteroids, but mostly they have been harmless. Right. And in that regard, one big example of this was what we saw in 2013, when a small asteroid of about 18 meters entered the Earth's atmosphere over Russia. And what was surprising about it was that scientists only noticed it after it had entered the atmosphere. And which also speaks to the fact that although scientists are tracking asteroids, it's impossible to track all of them. And the worry is really about the ones that we don't know about. Yeah, that's the big worry. And the 2013 incident that happened over a Soviet city over Siberia. So that was a fairly, that as you mentioned, it was about an 18 meter in size. The one that we are talking about would come in 2029. That's even bigger. That's actually, you know, at its widest, it's about 450 meters. So that's like, if you put it straight, it's bigger than some of our skyscrapers. So that's a fairly large. And if it actually hits the earth, it, you know, it'll have a huge, huge impact, right? It can kill millions of people, it can destroy several cities and those kind of things. But this one, the 2013 one was about 18 meters in size. That's also a fairly big one. It's a big sort of a rock. It got burnt in the process. But what happened was, apart from getting burnt, it also exploded midair. About 30 kilometers from Earth's surface, it exploded. And for a very brief while, the kind of glow that it had, it produced more brightness than the sun. Actually, for a very brief while, it was such a bright light in the sky so that everyone noticed, everyone over that town actually noticed. And the explosion also created, you know, it had repercussions down on the surface. It broke windows, it broke glass. And because people were, you know, coming near the windows to see what was happening, a lot of them got injured. So a lot of buildings were damaged and about 1,500 people were injured. And do we know why scientists could not notice it? Why they were blindsided by it? 
Apparently, it was coming from the side where the sun is. So it was coming from the sun side and it's difficult to locate. So it got disguised inside the glare and that's why it couldn't be detected. But the concern, as you rightly point out, is that there might be several others that we do not know of as of now. And suddenly we realize at the last minute that somebody is coming towards us. So that's why there is this huge program. You know, a lot of these space agencies now track the asteroids. We already track a few millions of them, actually. But again, this is a small fraction of what is out there. And now we have much more powerful systems in place to be able to track these. And Amitabh, saving the Earth from an asteroid is something we have seen in science fiction movies. But in 2022, NASA actually made that possible in a way by crashing one of its spacecrafts into an asteroid. Could you talk about how successful that experiment was and how significant it was for planetary defense? Yeah, so Hollywood has been doing it for several years now, for decades. But NASA did it for real about two years ago for the first time. So there was this asteroid that they had targeted. Now, that asteroid was not traveling towards the Earth. It wasn't a risk. There was no threat from that particular asteroid. Yeah, it was about 11 million kilometers away from Earth. Yes, yes. This was a technology demonstration. The demonstration of the fact that no space agencies now have that capability to do that. So this particular asteroid was targeted. NASA sent out a spacecraft in 2021. It took about a year to reach there and it, you know, collided head on. It just went and crashed into that asteroid. And uh, when it happened, we knew the crash had happened, but we didn't know whether it was actually successful in deviating the trajectory of the asteroid. So it's only now, in fact, some publications happened in March this year about that particular crash. And now the studies have actually shown it has been established that the asteroid got deformed in the process, that, you know, its shape was deformed. And more significantly, its trajectory was very different. So it has deviated from the its original trajectory. So what that means that that was a technology demonstration. So what it showed was that this kind of a mission can be undertaken, wherein if there is an asteroid that is coming towards the Earth, you can actually go and crash a spacecraft into it and make it deviate from its trajectory so that it moves away from the Earth. Even a small deviation, you know, over a large distances, that means it will not come near the Earth. So these kind of, as you said, sci-fi movies have been made for a very long time. But the actual, the real thing was carried out for the first time in 2022. And now that we have that capability, the idea is now to build on that capability and others would also like to have it. And Amitabh, does ISRO have any plans regarding this? Has it said anything specific? So ISRO has not talked about doing any such mission as of now, but it's just the first step. Now, what ISRO has said is we'll go and study and or more, you know, accurately, all that it has done said is that, you know, because such an event is happening in 2029, we should participate in the global efforts to study this asteroid. So this is just the first step that ISRO is taking towards developing this kind of planetary defense mechanism. And Amitabh, could you talk about why scientists want to study asteroids and why a lot of them are choosing Apophis to do that? Yeah, so because asteroids are actually, uh, they are not very well studied, right? So most of the missions, if you see of these space agencies, they are more interested in doing planets and the moons around the planets and deep space, what is there? Not enough studies have happened around asteroids. So what are they made of? What are their chemical composition is? So in the past, there have been a few missions that have gone, uh, Japanese missions, European missions. NASA, of course, has done a few missions for the asteroids. So the idea is now when this particular one is coming so close, it's much easier to send a spacecraft very close to it and then study it from very close quarters. And it's not just about sending spacecraft to study it. Lots of ground-based telescopes would be actually looking at it and making their own observations about the asteroid. So because it's happening so close, so it's a very good opportunity to study the asteroid. And in the end, we talk about the results of the recent bipoles in which the opposition parties part of the India bloc have emerged victorious, winning 10 
out of the 13 seats. Indian Express's Asad Rahman reported on them for the paper. These bipoles happened in seven states, including Bihar, Himachal Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Punjab, Uttarakhand, West Bengal and Tamil Nadu. The biggest highlight out of these results that came out on Saturday was that the India Alliance parties, four of them were in the fray, and they have managed to bag 10 seats out of the 13 that had gone to polls on July 10th. But there is a catch in saying just that these 10 seats have gone to the India Alliance because the India Alliance parties were also up against each other in more than one state. Like, for example, in West Bengal, the Congress was also in fray, the CPIM was also in fray, and the TMC was also in fray. So all these three parties, despite being in the India Alliance at the center, were up against each other. Similarly, in Punjab as well, Jalandhar West seat had seen a contest not just between NDA versus India, but also a contest between the Aam Admi Party and the Congress. Again, both allies of the India bloc at the center, but going against each other in state. So, yes, the India Alliance has won 10 seats out of the 13, but there is this catch that they were also up against each other. So, it's not a bipolar NDA versus India battle. It wasn't a fight between the NDA and India Alliance directly. But yes, it is definitely a positive result in the favor of uh, the India Alliance, which has managed to get 10 seats out of the 13. And Asad, when we look at these 13 seats, do we find a common thread between the results? Anything that stands out? The most interesting thing out of the results was that uh, it, barring Bihar and uh, Uttarakhand, the seats have been won by the parties ruling in the state. So, for example, in West Bengal, where four seats were had gone for polls, three of them were held by the BJP, one by the TMC. The TMC has managed to win all four. That is the ruling party in the state. Similarly, in Himachal, the Congress has done better. They won two out of the three seats. Then in Punjab, Ahmadmi Party, which is again the ruling party, has managed to win the seat, the single seat, Jalandhar West. Then in Madhya Pradesh, the one seat that went to election has been won by the BJP. Same for Tamil Nadu, where the DMK is the ruling party, it has won the seat. So the main pattern in these results was that the ruling parties in the states have done well, while the challenger has failed to make much gain in these states. And Asad, out of these opposition parties, who would you say was the biggest winner in that sense? Who would you say managed to gain the most out of these elections? So, if you look at the results, a cursory reading will give you the indication that the TMC has been the biggest winner in these elections because they contested four seats in West Bengal. Three of them were previously held by the BJP and the TMC has managed to win all four with big margins. So, by far, I think the TMC has been the biggest winner in this election. The Congress has also gained. The BJP and its ally, the JDU, have lost seats. So, Overall, I think the TMC led by West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee has been the biggest winner. And since the results came out yesterday, which gave them a clean sweep of all four seats, they've also tried to build this narrative that the people of West Bengal have rejected the BJP and their politics of, quote, hatred. And so these results have been the best for the TMC. But overall, if you look at them, the, the India bloc would be quite happy. And you can make that out from the reactions of the leaders. While Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah have not reacted to the bipolar results, Congress top leader Rahul Gandhi has already put out a tweet saying that this is a rejection of the BJP and, and an acceptance of the India bloc. So overall, the BJP-led NDA and India, this was the first time that they came head-to-head -head after the Lok Sabha elections. And I think the India bloc will be the happier of the two camps after these results. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.